Hey guys, and welcome back to the podcast. I hope you're all well, and thanks again for tuning in. We are, as I promised in the previous episode, running this bi-weekly podcast with Danny. So Danny is here with me, and we'll be doing our updates together as usual, sort of giving you a bit of a synopsis on our week, what we've done, and well, for Danny, the last two weeks, for me, the last week. And then we'll roll into, as as usual, Q&As from Instagram, so covering all of your questions and, of course, giving a little bit more of, like, a different perspective on things with Danny answering some questions, of course, some more relevant to to female questions as well and sharing a female experience, which I think is pretty important for uh, this podcast to have, especially as, obviously, I have Danny with me all the time, so it's a a pretty beneficial addition to, to the podcast. Okay, so... As always, ladies first, so we'll give Danny a little bit of air time to discuss how the past couple of weeks have gone for her, uh, how the mini cut is going, and yeah, then we'll take it from there. Go ahead. So before this week, I was deloading. Um, So my deload week was last week. It was very needed, and it just so happened to be in time with my menstrual cycle as well. Um, So I really felt like that came at the right time, and... My approach to deloading is currently, as programmed by my coach Luke, um, to keep intensity pretty high, not go to concentric failure because obviously the whole point of a deload is not to batter yourself, but still keep intensity quite high and just reduce volume for the week to alleviate a bit of fatigue and uh, facilitate recovery. So then going into this week, I felt really, really good. My training has been brilliant like I have beaten previous PBs on my push session especially um by quite a a long way um and really quite shocked myself with that because usually my push sessions are one of the first things to suffer when I'm in a deficit um so I was really impressed with that and my lower body session went really well pull went okay um not incredible but decent my RDLs were all right but not a record breaker um but other than that this week has been brilliant a really 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 good week of training so far today is rest day we both done fasted cardio this morning um and we'll be back in the gym tomorrow we've been training at ultraflex most this week and we will be for the rest this week um which is my favorite gym training ever (laughs) um but yeah really really good week of training in terms of the mini court my scale weight was not playing ball at the start of the mini cut due to being due on my menstrual cycle and um I also introduced Yohimbine which can cause water retention so we don't know whether that affected things as well um but it has started to trend down now which is really positive so um things are finally heading in the right direction after a few scale weight fluctuations due to water retention and things like that time of the month and just so you girls know everybody deals with it you know it's normal um it's something we all have to go through and at that time of the month you just have to kind of take your scale weight with a pinch of salt accept that it could be slightly skewed data just accept that it's part of life um take it for what it is keep ticking the boxes and let it settle and see how um you've progressed once the menstrual cycle period has passed <laughs> um but yeah feeling really really good now and things are moving in the right direction like i said there is another like three and a half weeks left of this mini cut. Yeah, if you keep it to six weeks, yeah. If I keep it to six weeks, well, we're going on holiday straight after. Yeah. yeah. So probably ha- another three and a half weeks, yeah. unless we continue it post holiday. Yeah. Um. So Which is food. Not happen. No, probably <laughs> not. <laughs> food was dropped this week, so I have been on lower food, but um, I'm happy with that, and I'm happy to keep pushing. To be honest. Yeah. What's your calories for? Like, just relative terms. Obviously, people don't follow these calories, but people are always interested in where people's calories are at. So my non-training day macros are 140 protein, 120 carb, and 45 fat at the minute. That's what they've been dropped to this week. Um, And my training day macros are 150 protein, 190 carb, and 42 fat that is so what i have is a range like my coach sets me a macro target and then i have a range and because of basically my personality type i always go towards the lower end of the range so luke who sets my macros sets them a bit above where i've just 
reeled them off where I've just said that they are. Um, but I go to the lower end of the range because I always like to push, basically. Um, yes, yeah. And in terms of cardio, I'm currently doing 130 minutes over the week. I'm doing 40 minutes fasted, usually on a push day, 50 minutes on my first rest day of the week, and um, 40 minutes on my last rest day of the week. Yeah, yeah perfect. So that gives you a bit of an idea as to where Danny's at and what she's doing. Obviously, this phase is just to potentiate some more room for the next gaining phase and then up on obviously until up until 2020 where you'll probably fit in another, maybe another mini diet before 2020 potentially depends on where you're, See where how you're at and how, how this one goes. Because obviously this one, ideally you'd have been a bit ahead of where you're at right now, yeah. which is ultimately frustrating, but it allows you to, you know, potentially realise aspects of, of prep where you're going to have to push a bit harder or you, well, how your body's going to respond in a prep setting as well. Yeah. Which I think is good rather than getting the shock immediately in prep and having to drop calories even harsher than you I think also expect. every time you diet, it's different. Like every prep has been different for me. Yeah, sure. Every mini cut's been different. There's been preps where I haven't had to go like below about 1,700 calories. Yeah. And there's preps where I've had to dig pretty deep and had a lot of cardio so you know every prep finish is different and it, you never really know how it's going to go you've just got to deal with it to the best of your ability and obviously prioritize health as much as you can but do what has to be done at the end of the day yeah for sure awesome cool so a bit of a wrap up on myself so obviously last time we spoke thursday Friday I had upper body session which was very successful because I've reprogrammed that a little bit. Basically my bench and my standing bar while HP. I hadn't done them both in a while and I know that those are movements that in the previous mesocycle before I started this mini cut were actually stalling quite a bit. So I'd progressed the OHP for a good eight week block. I'd progressed the bench for a good eight week block getting up to 100 kgs for good three sets of 10 which is pretty strong for, for a barbell bench press for me so replace those with an incline barbell bench which I'm really liking and if anything if I can build that sort of top line density then that's gonna definitely improve a lot of the shots where I'm a little bit weaker so thinking of from an individual perspective as to whether the incline or the, the flat is a little bit more sort of beneficial for me and my physique obviously like there's there's from a barbell flat to a barbell incline there's not a huge amount of difference in this sense that we are just again training the chest we're training the pec um if you really want to target the upper pec itself you've got to sort of set yourself up in a way where you're going to line the the force up with the clavicular fibers so something like a cuffed incline fly might be more preferable if you're really wanting to target the upper pecs as opposed to just simply hopping on an incline and thinking that you're training your, your upper chest um, you might be a bit more and personally i actually feel more of a contraction or connection in the upper pec in abbreviation points i would do that if i was on video um but yeah so long story short changed a few movements there they both felt very very good and hitting pretty much all time pbs on both of those those movements so very excited to, to progress them and that's tomorrow's session so i'm looking forward to that be hitting that ultra flex with with my client quace who will be competing in men's physique in 10 weeks time so he'll be doing the the northern uk dfba which is very exciting and he's got a lot of potential so be looking over him in person tomorrow as well so yeah then obviously we came into the weekend and i flew to edinburgh for the uk dfba show which was really enjoyable um, very good show, of course, run by Lee and Amy, and the Scottish is quite special for me, to be honest, because it's the only time in the year, like, even at Worlds, I don't get this kind of time where I get to spend, like, a good amount of time with Lee and Amy, just Lee and Amy, because we flew out there together, so you spent time on the flight together in the airport, um, just back and forth chatting, like, just non-stop about bodybuilding another just complete garbage <laughs> uh but it's amazing to spend time with lee and amy and they they literally like when when we landed in uh, after the show they 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 did they, they told me they were like oh no we, we treat you as family mate because they offered to, to to drop me off home um they just they're just so kind they're literally so kind and uh it's weird i even said to lee i was like 
I feel, I feel like I'm their son when I go away to the Scottish with them. Um, I feel, <laughs> I feel, I feel like, uh, like I'm, like I'm a kid. It's, it's, it's quite nice to be honest. Um, and they just, yeah, like I said, they treat me so well. Um, and I always have a great time when we go away with them. So the show itself was, was pretty epic in the sense that the venue was ridiculous because the venue that we were meant to be at in Portobello was was cancelled because some sort of ceiling fell down in the in the balcony of the the actual auditorium so it got replaced with the Edinburgh Assembly Halls which is crazy it's like a ridiculous venue and we're hoping to go the back there next year because it will be like one of the best places to hold hold, hold the show the stage was amazing. The actual place itself was ridiculous. It felt like you were in some sort of just, oh my God, it was just ridiculous. Like very, very well established uh, environment for a, for a bodybuilding show. It's not the usual venue that you'd find a bodybuilding show being held at. So we had to be very careful with the tans and making sure that tan didn't go all over the place because we'd have got kicked out. So yeah, show itself in terms of the caliber. Across most of the classes, I'd say it was like, decent caliber however in the fit body and the juniors there were some really good standouts caitlin and fit body was absolutely off the charts impressive as soon as you saw her come out i was like okay she's got very good sort of british champion potential caliber which is scary because i've got i've got I've got someone who I really want to be winning that, <laughs> and uh, I think I think she'll give her a really good battle. But Caitlin's very very good, and in juniors, Connor, um, he was very very good prepped by Jack Thorburn, and yeah, they 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 really sort of brought it, and he he looked amazing. A little weak in, if I'm honest, and Connor, if you listen to this, this is purely constructive. A little weak in the back shot so in the rear double on the rear uh, rear double on the rear lat spread just a little weak in those shots and the rear rear relaxed so if he's going to get beaten anywhere by anyone it's going to be someone with a strong back because he's just lacking a little bit in density in those areas which obviously is going to be very hard to improve on for the finals because you don't have much time to spend in an environment to, to grow in between shows but yeah he was great and yeah, besides that, bikini overall winner was pretty good for the UK DFBA standard. Obviously, the standard across like UK DFBA to PCA to two bros is like tiered. But for UK DFBA standards, like Laura was really good. And she she will be probably very good at the finals from a UK DFBA standpoint. So, um, yes, great show. Good weekend. Came back, stupid decision with RDLs and like tweaked my left lower back doing that. But it seems touch wood to be absolutely fine now. I was a little worried this morning that I wouldn't be able to do the stairs, but as soon as I'd warmed up, I knew I was like, yeah, okay, stairs will be fine this morning. It was just a little tight upon wake from training lower body yesterday. But yeah, so I've done pull, push, lower body, and yeah, pull and push were really, really good, to be honest. Apart from the stupid decision on RDL, pull's, pull was a decent session. Push trained with Adrian and James, both lovely lads. And if you're not following them, make sure to check them out on Instagram. I also did uh, filmed a sort of a raw style video with them for the member site, which is up now. So you can check that out. That was our session with Push. Pretty much retained numbers on that. And again, that's probably what I'm looking for for the rest of this phase. Because I think for me, realistically, to build strength, especially in Pushes, is just going to be very much impossible with body weight coming down. And yeah, that's pretty much me wrapped up. About nine pounds down so far in the mini cut. So, and I'm definitely seeing that from a visual perspective. I probably won't take any photos tomorrow just because we're in Sheffield and the lighting's different. And I just want to take photos where I can I can compare them really accurately. So I'll take photos next Friday, which will be two weeks since I've taken the last ones. So I should definitely see some changes by then. And actually that kind of gives you a bit of a... Uh, sort of an answer to potentially someone's questions in the sense that when mini cutting I almost like to take photos a little less frequently just to add motivation to the phase because when I take photos weekly in a mini cut because of just glycogen and water shifts I'm not seeing much happening like if anything on a first in a week's difference you might actually look worse because you've just gotten flatter in a week so right now I'm like really really flat like carbs are 300 on a training day which is very low for me and then carbs are like 150 200 on a non-training day 
and that's super low for me as well. Like both of those numbers are really, really low. So I'm very, very flat. I'm still getting good pumps because I manage sodium and potassium really well in water, but I am I'm flat, so I'm not going to see a lot of detail. If anything, I'm probably going to look my best when I finish mini cutting in six and a half weeks' time. Six and a half weeks in three and a half weeks' time. Jesus, <laughs> and uh, and I fill up on the food that we have in our holiday, and then I take loads of Instagram photos. Like yeah. full as hell. We're going to Grand Canary, guys. Yes. Have you mentioned? Yeah. No, I haven't. No, mm-hmm. it's a secret. That's bored in there. No, that's some joking. It's not a secret. Yeah, it's a secret, yeah. Secret holiday, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we're going to Gran Canaria in three and a half weeks. Yeah, and I don't know if I mentioned last week. I think I did. Um, The reason month. I... Well, yeah, last couple of weeks ago. The reason I actually am doing this mini cut is because of a photo shoot. Um, I probably wouldn't have done one this soon if I hadn't had it. But I... Yeah, I was trying to convince you not to do it anyway. Well, yeah, but... And then I joined in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be critical. Hop aboard the mini cut. Hop train. aboard. No, I actually yeah, did. Yeah, AJ need, copied me I with did the mini need cut. A mini cut. Um, but no, I was pretty much where I, <laughs> I was pretty much at like my max above my stage weight, which I wanted to push up anyway. Um, so it was it was pretty all right timing. Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. I mean, you gained pounds in the first week as well. Yeah, yeah. Gain two pounds. Starts mini cut gains two pounds. Yeah, females we have it a lot harder than guys do, and I lost they nine. should think themselves lucky. I lost nine pounds. Yeah, great, fantastic. Twelve pounds ahead. All right, so let's <laughs> should we crack into the questions? Okay, so first question. We'll take we'll take the one from Christian, which we talked about last night in the car. So Christian asks, "What are your favourite features of each other?" <laughs> And worst things about each other. So this is more of a sort of a jokey play one. We'll answer some good ones in a bit if you're actually interested in learning something from this podcast as well. So go ahead, Danny. What What's the favourite things? The favourite things is everything. Yes. Good. Apart from <laughs> this answer. the, what is it? The worst thing? The worst yeah, attribute? What's the, what's, the, uh, what's the worst things? Yeah, all things. All okay, thing. the worst thing about AJ is when he sings. <laughs> because he doesn't just sing. It's like... It's good. It's he, very good. He completely ruins the song that you're listening to. So that is my uh, pet hate of AJ's. Okay, okay. But everything else I love about AJ. Yeah. Soppy. Soppy podcast. Same thing applies for for Danny of course like you know people will know how much I talk about Danny on the podcast you can probably tell how much I care about her so that's that doesn't need to sort of be said but the worst thing is probably uh, the the thing you've been doing recently where you call it a love tap which is not a love tap Danny's love taps is where she smashes me over the face with her hand which is actually like a proper aggressive slap and she 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 actually like quotes it as a love tap. It's not a love tap, and actually it genuinely hurts quite a lot of the time. It's a gesture of affection. <laughs> it's not. It's and not it at all. Hurt. It's, not, it's hurt. not at all. It does hurt. So that's that's the one slightly annoying thing. But outside of that, Danny is fantastic. Mm. Yay! Okay, next question. So, yeah, this is a good question from my client, Dan. So he asked about whether there is a, like, do you believe there's an age where natural bodybuilders are in their prime and, or, and, or comes with, or does your best come with the maximum amount of experience that you've had? So I think that I'll take this first because I think there's more older bodybuilding competitors than there are bikini competitors. Yeah, definitely. So... Yeah, I think it's a different scenario with females, and Danny will. I might, will mention some. Yeah, that. Danny will discuss that. But from my perspective, I think that yeah, definitely there's a prime in terms of where you're going to be your best as a natural bodybuilder, and I think that does come quite late, probably late as late as your late thirties, perhaps even your early forties, and this really comes down to the level of maturity within the muscle. So this is what I kind of coin as density. Okay, muscle density. Now, this is just like the layers of granite tissue that you have underneath the fat that you occur in the off-season. And when you see it, like, for example, in a junior or a teenage competitor, you'll see them diet down, diet down, diet down, and they're like, I want to get harder, I want to get harder. And they'll reach this, like, peak capacity of where they can no longer get leaner because all they're doing is pulling away from what they have from a muscularity standpoint and they just actually start looking softer and softer and almost like a stringy look and it looks really odd because you're like 
surely this should this guy should be getting leaner when in actual fact they're just getting flatter and flatter and going beyond the conditioning that their muscularity can can warrant them whereas older competitors you can almost definitely get away with pushing them to the absolute nth degree of conditioning because they've got that muscle maturity and density to sort of give that granite hard look when they're even at very, very low body fat settings, okay? So the best you're going to be is when you have the maximum level of muscle maturity and density and combine that with your ability to push really hard in a diet phase. And that's why you see these like Masters competitors like Danny Cena herself at like, you know, the top caliber British final shows. Masters competitors just coming out and just looking grainy and like disgusting. Like they just have layers and layers and layers of hard earned muscle maturity. And it's also why I think that actually, funnily enough, a lot of the best competitors are the competitors, like the ones that come and do their first show and they come out of nowhere. Like there was a guy at the Scottish this weekend, he won the heavyweight and the overall. He's never competed before. He just came out of nowhere, absolutely came out of nowhere and decided to hop on stage. He actually hopped on stage because someone told him in the gym, I don't believe you're natural. Like he said, I don't believe you're natural at all. Um, and he said, right, I'm going to fucking prove it. I'm going to go and do a natural show. He didn't even really massively want to do could, to do it from a competitive standpoint, just loves training. But he said, I'm going to do a natural show and I'll show you that, that I'm natural. And he did it and he's like, and he looked ridiculous, but he'd been training since he was like 15, just hiding away in gyms, never really dieting down to contest level, but just accruing more and more and more and more density and density and density. And that's what I see over people that have like almost like being late bloomers to competitive aspects of the sport so they're just chasing muscularity gains and improvements and less dieting periods and they have crazy crazy amounts of density like brian whitaker is probably one of the most dense lightweights you'll ever see and he didn't start competing until i think his late 20s so you know sometimes when i i look at the way I, I i'm planning out things and i'm like Am I really doing this all too early or anything like that? But I think a lot of your density is actually within your level of strength in the gym. Um, and if you're pretty damn strong, you're probably going to have a dense looking body part and a mature looking body part, especially if you've handled those weights consistently. You know, like my lower body density is pretty good just because I've handled heavy weights. You know, when I was 17 years old, I was squatting 140 for like the good three sets of like high rep sets so above tens and there's not many you know 17 year olds that are doing that there's some freaks out there that are but there's not many and so the leg density that i've earned is through years and years and years of handling like heavy loads consistently so yeah i would say like late 30s early 40s is where you're going to hit your peak provided that you can get to that point relatively injury free because a lot of people won't even make that point i'll be very happy touch wood to make like late 30s early 40s and be able to train relatively pain-free that's a goal of mine to be able to train like a still like an animal like i am now into my late 30s early 40s so um got to be cautious with a few things but that's where i think i'll be my best so yeah danny do you want to take your comments on like bikini competitors or females first of all i agree with everything aj said especially considering that um Muscle density and maturity develops definitely with age, especially training age, not just age in general, but training age. Um, and that shows on stage. And I'm a classic example of that. Like when I stepped on stage with two bros, I think it was very obvious looking at the stage pictures that I was just lacking muscle density and muscle maturity because I was one of the younger girls on stage and everyone else like I usually compete as a junior but with two bros they didn't have a junior category at the time so I competed in my height class and it was just quite clear that the thing I was lacking I still placed well yeah but the thing that I was lacking was like muscle maturity basically I just lacked muscle maturity because I was younger than the other girls and I didn't have the same training age as they did um so that is something I need to develop, hence why I took this year away from the stage, away from dieting, developing muscle tissue and getting really strong. Um, so, yeah, I think that is something to consider. And then as a female as well, there's 
other things you need to take into account if you do want to like continue competing when you're older because as a lot of you will know a lot of bikini competitors or figure competitors a lot of female athletes do lose their menstrual cycle when they enter a contest prep or at the back end of a contest prep um and the longer you go without your menstrual cycle usually the longer it takes to get it back so if you're wanting to have kids in the future that is something you need to consider and you need to make sure that you are regaining your menstrual cycle post-show um and try and minimize the amount of time you spend without that cycle um so if you that's something to consider if you're wanting to compete when you are older and me personally if I do decide I want children in the future I probably won't compete around that sort of time because I know that I want to be able to have kids in the future so it's something you may need to consider if you are thinking about that that you may lose your menstrual cycle during a contest prep which may minimize your chances of getting pregnant and there are other risks that come alongside that as you guys will know as well yeah cool fantastic so next question is so uh, i mean i've covered that one quite frequently so next question is signs that you might need a diet break so I haven't covered this one recently. I have covered it before, but I'll cover it again. Give my current thoughts. So, I think one one of the main reasons that you'll need a diet break is that you can't continue to make fat loss progress efficiently. So you're digging a, a bigger hole of diet fatigue that's becoming such a big hole that you're accruing such a large amount of water retention that it's actually blurring or potentiating so much loss in progress because you're you're recurring so much water weight okay i see this a lot in people that try and dig exponentially for a really like short-term fat loss goal whether it's you know getting ready for a show and they're late and they're like rushing and they just end up like digging 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 and all they do is just look flatter and actually have like start developing like a film of water weight and they just look worse basically so if you want to focus on obviously looking better and continuing to look better and improving, then sometimes you do have to remove that diet fatigue to actually actualize the fat loss progress that you've that you've made. You know, over the last however many weeks you've been dieting down. So, but however, how how many people actually do that and get to a point where they've pushed so hard that they they really need a diet break, or how many people actually have enough time for a diet break? It's, pretty minimal to be honest um pretty minimal like you know there's not a lot of people that i've given diet breaks yet um george is probably one of the only ones and one of my other female clients that i've given diet breaks just because they're on track or they're even a bit ahead of schedule if this is for a competitive reason um however you know you can split up conventional diets that are just getting you lean for holidays or getting you lean for you know just an event or something like that you can split up more extended diet diet phases with diet breaks to just make the whole process a little easier you know in the sense that taking a calorie taking your calories up to maintenance for an entire week is just going to ease the pressure of dieting potentially allow for some more social events um, allow for a period of time where you can be a bit more relaxed with your intake um, and just generally make the diet a more sustainable process for you as opposed to just consistently being in a in a net deficit so like other signs i mean daniel will discuss a few for, for for sort of females but it's very similar male to female but like just to, to general like motivation to actually get through the day and diet itself is going to be very low motivation to train is dropping back off um, like I said, you're developing maybe a bit of a film of water weight. Your recovery is going down, which again may be a sign of, of training fatigue. I've talked about this before in the sense that diet fatigue and training fatigue are like somewhat linked. So the feelings of being in a, in a position where your training fatigue is is high and the feelings of like diet fatigue being high are very, very similar feelings. So you've got to be able to distinguish which is which and make sure that you're in a position to determine that so that that really revolves around the amount of time that you've that you've been dieting and whether you have a good coach on board to be able to take your data and think okay right you've got diet fatigue or you've got training fatigue um your logbook will really sort of answer a lot of those questions for you as well with the training fatigue aspect um and i mean 
yeah, like ultimately time 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 towards the show as well. Like if you've got the actual amount of time to be able to do a diet break, um, that's one one to heavily consider. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what I would sort of say about needing a diet break. What what about you? Yeah, I agree with that. And I think diet breaks don't just have a place with competitors because I coach, I still coach quite a lot of general population clients as well. And like AJ said, to break up like a really extended, a long period of dieting, sometimes it is really useful to implement a diet break. Um, And a lot of the reason for that is not just physical but psychological as well because if somebody is dieting for say uh, a lot like for example I've got a client who has her wedding at the end of this year and she's been dieting for a very long time she won't mind me saying this she's I'm not going to name her name but she won't mind me saying um she's lost quite a lot of weight since the start of her weight loss journey and she just she needed something to break that up there isn't a way like psychologically not many people can handle dieting for months and months and months and months on end especially if you haven't got the extreme end goal of stepping on stage so sometimes breaking that up with a diet break just gives you a bit of a chance to reset yourself physically and mentally um so that you've got that oomph back to push on post diet break. So it is a really beneficial thing to implement, even if you aren't a competitor, as long as you allow enough time to get ready for your end goal, whatever that may be. I think diet breaks can be really beneficial, like I said, both mentally and physically. Um, and I think some another occasion which a competitor could utilise a diet break potentially is between shows. Yeah. Um. Obviously, if you're already in stage condition and your your go- your goal is not to get leaner for the next show, um, and you've got quite a short period of time between shows, a diet break is something that you could consider if your goal is to just maintain the condition you have and not dig harder. If your feedback is coming leaner, then yeah, carry on dieting. But if you've got um, if you've got into the necessary condition, you could consider a diet break between shows. Um, and all of the reasons AJ said, basically. But yeah, I think a large part of it is the psychological benefit of a diet break with a lot of people um, when dieting for a really long period of time or like between shows. Yes. Yeah, I mean, psychologically, it's very, very, very hard to take a diet break bet- between shows because obviously as you're, you're always like wanting to get leaner in a, in a, in a contest prep. Um, I took one diet break after my first show, the 2017 season. It was just like the hardest thing I've ever done because you get into such a great routine with your eating patterns and your food choices. And then when you're given like maintenance calories, you don't really know what to do with them, to be honest. And it's a bit of a psychological stall because you know that realistically you're not losing weight in a diet break because you're maintaining. So you know you're not making any progress. It's very hard to accept you're not making any progress when I gave one of my clients previously a diet break, she did struggle with the whole aspect of not losing any more fat in that week. But what you've got to see it as is like potentiating more fat loss later on. Like you're not yeah. losing fat right now, cool, but you're at least you're removing fatigue so it becomes easier in the, in, in the weeks to come. And it's not a step back. Like a diet break is not a period of time where you gain body fat. No. It's almost like a step to the side, a step no. at maintenance. It's not, you've got to think of it as a positive thing, not a step backwards. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Okay, so this can be for you. So strategies to deal with a lost cycle in female clients. So like, you know, when someone loses their cycle, let's say you're dieting down, like what, what do you do? How do you deal with that? Do you, how do you explain it to them? And what's the plans to sort of deal with, with, with a lost cycle? Well, the reason, so first of all, the reason someone would lose their menstrual cycle, um, for example, in a contest prep is because they are in a state of low energy availability. So your energy availability is the amount of energy you have left over after like all of your training, your energy expenditure through general activity, etc. for bodily processes. And what happens when that energy is limited, your body will sacrifice 
things that it doesn't think it needs such as your menstrual cycle so that is why you would lose your menstrual cycle because you're in a state of low energy availability you've not got enough energy left over to sustain your uh, bodily functions basically and to keep you alive your body goes right okay we don't need a menstrual cycle right now um so first thing like assess when it's happened because if it's very close to a show it is something that does happen to a lot of females. I myself, I'll admit, I lose my menstrual cycle in a contest prep. To get stage lean, I I have to sacrifice that. I can't really... Well, so far, I haven't been able to do it without it. Um, so it is something a lot of females have to go through. And your priority is just basically to get it back as soon as you possibly can post-show and you're going to do that by increasing food, going through a bit of a recovery period with training, uh, reducing your training volume to facilitate that recovery and basically reduce your output so you have increased energy availability and you have a better chance of getting your menstrual cycle back. Um, so yeah, just take the necessary steps post-show, increase calorie in intake, decrease training volume, allow yourself to recover, decrease cardio, um, decrease steps and just prioritise health basically. Um, also make sure that you do ensure that it's not down to anything else. There are things like polycystic ovaries which can cause an absence of a menstrual cycle or an irregular menstrual cycle. So if you do lose your cycle, the, the best thing to do first of all is go and get it checked out and make sure it's nothing serious. Um, but if it is just due to a state of low energy availability, you've just got to prioritise getting it back as soon as you physically can, as soon as you possibly can. Um, but make sure you do get it checked out just in case, like check it's nothing else that's causing that. Um, also something to consider, if you are on the contraceptive pill, you will get a withdrawal bleed each month. This is not a natural menstrual cycle. It basically masks whether you have a natural cycle or not. So it's something you need to be aware of because if you're on the pill through a contest prep, you might not know if you've lost your cycle because the pill is masking that. You're having a withdrawal bleed anyway. So although you might think you have a cycle, you might not. So it's still important to stay on top of your health and take the necessary steps post-show to maximise recovery and look after your health. Also, there are the basic things you can do. Like, obviously, just don't do not do stupid things through a prep. And if you're coaching a female, don't take really drastic steps when it comes to calorie cuts and cardio increases. Take a nice, steady approach. Allow plenty of time so that you don't have to be extreme with your approach. Um, and don't do anything stupid, basically. Just be sensible with it. And just think of prioritising health like you would with a male. Um, but just remember you're dealing with a really small female and the calories are probably going to have to get lower and you've just got to be aware of that and not do anything stupid. Yeah, for sure. Good answer. That's par. And whilst we're on that topic, and obviously I know that I've got some clients and I've coached people through regaining the menstrual cycle. Of course, you, you highlighted the importance of, of trying to get it back and obviously we know the importance of trying to get it back in terms of you know long term health and potential to have kids in the future and things like and that. And osteoporosis as well. Like if you go without your cycle for a long period of time, it can um, basically decrease your bone health and put you at a greater risk of osteoporosis. Yeah. So it's not just about having kids. Yeah, 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 yeah. The ramifications are are pretty significant. So my actual question was. What do you think of the idea of like the Stephanie Buttermore thing that she's popularizing at the moment with regards to going all in and having caloric intake extremely high and trying to basically gain a, a fairly significant amount of body weight per week in the attempts to get your body back to essentially homeostasis as fast as possible in some individuals, especially with people that have very skewed leptin and ghrelin which is sending hunger hormones out of whack to a point where people can't control hunger they're very ravenous they have phases of very low appetite very high appetite etc so what do you think about that i think what stephanie is doing is good um i think it's important to point out that her like i read her post and i've listened to her youtube video and her sole focus is not to put on body weight that's not the drive the drive is just to eat to satiety and at the minute her hunger hormones are all over the place so her satiety is her eating mm. like four thousand calories a day or whatever she's eating um 
so her goal is basically to restore her hunger hormones back to normal um and counteract any negative effects that she's experienced from dieting Mm. she's got extreme food focus um obviously an extremely large appetite and she wants to basically feel normal again um so i understand the reasoning behind it i've not read the book that a lot of it is based on which is no period now what however i have been recommended that so if it's something you are struggling with yourself maybe have a look at that book i've been recommended it with before um and i think it's a great approach but i don't know i find it hard to like is there an extent where that becomes a bit too much Mm, i wouldn't prescribe it to clients yeah like is it an extent does it become a bit too much past a certain extent like where's the limit sort of thing because yeah, obviously trying I to think... branch over this this period of time of low any en- low energy availability and getting into a positive energy balance sometimes doesn't take a lot but for people who have experienced like i've noticed in and you've noticed as well with people that you coach people that have been through anorexic periods or eating disorders have somewhat of a shift in their metabolic rate to the point where their food has to get extortionately high to even bridge that balance between a maintenance and a surplus i think it's great that she's prioritizing health i think that's a fantastic point yeah yeah as long as like if you were to consider it yourself you can't think your goal is body composition related because it's not the whole goal of that is just health Yeah, yeah so if you have a body composition goal you aren't necessarily going to achieve that goal best by following the all-in approach. You oh, probably no, aren't going to no. achieve your goals. And you're most likely so, going to gain weight at a pretty yeah. fast rate. Just listening to her hunger yeah. signals, which are completely out of whack. You know, like, so I understand the process. She's gained 15 pounds. Yeah, so. I understand the process behind it. I'd be interested to read the book yeah, and so have a little bit of more of a look into it so that I understand it better. But I think... Yeah, I think it's great for her and her goals and health and whatever. And if you've really struggled with, like, not having a cycle, your hunger hormones being all over the place, it might be a good approach to take. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think it's for everybody, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I think the role of, like, for for some people, the role of stress is huge. Like, every time someone has regained a menstrual cycle with me that hasn't had it for a period of time, it's been a time when they've been deloading. And when external stress has been low and unfortunately a lot of the people that I work with love training extremely hard. And what they've got to realise is that 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 training stimulus in a sense is is putting more stress upon their body. Their body can't deal with it at a point where it's already sacrificing things like their cycle. And actually sometimes bringing down training intensity and actually bringing down frequency, bringing down volume and focusing on doing workouts that are productive that they can still train but lowering that stress from from training from that aspect of things and actually having them train like, you know, unfortunately, like how they don't want to train for a little bit is going to put them in a position to have that low stress environment, calories are high and the chances of their cycle returning in a perhaps a shorter fashion is, is much more warranted. I think the all-in approach is basically an exaggerated version of what say you would do with a client and what I would do with a client because we would obviously reduce training volume which is what Stephanie's done she's reduced training she's done and we would work calorie intake up yeah um and it's like for example me post show I reduced training volume my hunger hormones were all over the place I wanted to eat the world but I took the necessary steps I reduced training volume gradually increased my calorie intake I had periods of time where I didn't track so much Um, And eventually what happened is my hunger hormones started to regulate. I started to feel satiated after eating meals um, and I could recover from from training. Apart from New York. (laughs) Yeah, apart from New York. (laughs) Probably post New York that this happened, to be honest. Um, But yeah, I started to feel normal again and I started to feel full after eating meals and I started to recover from training. I regained my menstrual cycle. So all of that happened, but with a more moderate approach. Mm. So this is just... I suppose it's called all in for a reason. (laughs) Mm. She's just taking an extreme approach to doing that and trying to get it back in the fastest way possible, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And I also think like it's a very smart tactic for her because it is something that anything novel or like interesting or new or, you know, 
attractive in a, in, in a different way is going to is going to bring people in. You know, people are going to invest in her series because it's something that not many people have done, not many people are willing to share, and not many people are willing to do. So, and also like the whole the whole tagline of her consuming four thousand calories made me even interested because I'm like, okay, why is a girl of her size consuming four thousand calories? It doesn't make sense. So I wanted to watch. So the sort of elusive aspect of it is pretty significant, but. Yeah, I think overall she is sending a good fucking message because I know there's some people out there that really do struggle with the idea of eating enough to regain basically their body's homeostasis. I think for some people it's appropriate. Yeah, yeah, I for sure, for sure, for sure. But as long as they follow it accurately and they don't just sort of say, oh, I'm hopping on the bandwagon and do it. And they do it just because they feel like, oh, I'll just eat, I'll eat like, you know, just, just to like, f- till I feel full. And then for some people that, are in a restrictive mindset, their full is restrictive and they'll actually end up under eating more than they would when they were tracking, you know. So for a lot of people, I think that actually tracking in this period of time where caloric intake is so vital for human health is actually very, 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 very beneficial. Yeah. Like I have some clients, if they didn't track, they would under eat, which is what AJ is yeah, saying. I have quite a few like that. And that would be unhealthy for them to under eat. For, so for some people, tracking is not to restrict. It's to make sure they eat enough for health. Yeah. It's not kind of, you can't consume this amount. It's you need to consume this amount to be in a healthy position in order to progress. Yes. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Cool. That was good. That's going to probably be the tagline of the the podcast. I have a question. Regain your cycle (laughs) with Danny Bosworth. Oh, my God. (laughs) I have a question from Beth, my client. She said, do you have similar coaching approaches? um, And do you always agree on what to do with clients? I'll go first. Okay, you go first. Yeah, you just go first me on this. Okay. Um, so yes, we have similar coaching approaches. We both coach our clients through audio. Obviously AJ uses, um, what are you doing? (laughs) AJ, sorry, AJ was just laughing at one of the other questions that I got on Instagram. That guy's a fucking freak. (laughs) Um, How is the Duchess of Rotherham today? We're answering best question. That guy's an absolute cretin. Someone asked me, how is the Duchess of Rotherham today? I'm guessing the Duchess... Maybe means me. He, he can go away. <laughs> but anyway. Absolute moron. Okay, so to answer your question, Beth, um, we do have similar coaching approaches, yes. We both, obviously, I do, you'll know this because you're one of my clients, I do my check-ins via voice note um, because I think hearing someone's voice is really important and it gives me a lot of information in itself mm-hmm. and it promotes quite in-depth check-ins and I always give in-depth check-in responses. AJ's is very similar, but he does um, video so he can see his clients' faces. Um, And we've had this conversation before about like doing video versus not doing video. And I definitely think it has its benefits. But um, me personally, like I feel as though a lot of my clients wouldn't want to do video because they are female and they'd feel like they had to make an effort for that video, etc. And it's much easier and quicker to get my, um, in my opinion, my, yeah, absolutely, I agree. My voice notes agree. over via WhatsApp as opposed to uploading to YouTube, and I'm not yeah. as clued up as AJ is on YouTube either. Yeah, um, I agree. And our approaches in terms of the amount of care we give is very similar. Yeah. Um, and how much we put into our coaching process, yeah. like how much we care how much we put into expanding our knowledge like attending seminars etc um our programming in regards to nutrition is very similar we set macros as opposed to giving fixed meal plans and give like guides of how to structure our clients days um and yeah very similar i think there's things we do differently and obviously the majority of aj's clients are male bodybuilders and i have more gen pop clients than aj does mm. in which case a different method is required um and i have some clients who like do bits of tracking here and do bits of tracking there and then i have some contest prep clients who track everything really accurately so i think a different approach is applied to each client depending on 
them as an individual, their preferences and their goals. Um, but our approach in general towards the majority of our clients is similar in terms of the care we give, the like how in depth the quality of services, etc. Yeah, I think you pretty much covered most things there, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, outside of that, apart from like the videos and things like that, I guess at the moment, which is something that will very, very quickly change, I I probably have a lot more competitive clients that, yeah. that are hopping on stage, but that's just because the amount of time I've I've been in this. You know, I remember like Danny's only been full time online coaching since December, you know. So and I've been like full time online coaching since twenty fifteen, you know. So it's it's the time the time difference is huge and. Obviously, I'm massively proud of Danny for doing what she's done in the time span. She has done it. It's ridiculous, if I'm honest. And the amount of competitors. Like, I keep telling her, like, you know, she needs to set her goals as, like, coaching top-tier athletes. And, th and that's what she will be doing. And, and literally, like, you can mark my words, in, in a year or two's time, she'll have people turning IFBB Pro under her coaching. And, you know, that that's, that's where her business will go. And that's evidently she has a load of passion for coaching gen pop people and she's very very good at it very very good at it because you can speak to people very well and have that sort of empathy and have the right tone of voice i think i saw a post actually from jordan peters who coached one gen pop client and said i'm not usually the best to coach gen pop and i was like <laughs> nodding my head at that because i know that he's not but i think i'm heading that way too because i think i'm losing not 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 this is a bad thing but i'm losing my ability to coach gen pop because i'm so invested in competitive athletes so my mindset towards the way that i coach my tone of voice my level of empathy um level of empathy is slowly dropping off um obviously it's still there but it's it's like when people make an excuse it's like right we'll crack the fuck on then like that's the kind of response as opposed to thinking, all right, okay, don't worry about this this sort of off plan meal you had. It's okay. It's yeah. not. It's not okay in a contest. And plan. I definitely it's different. I adapt my tone of voice, yeah, of my response, you. and the way that I coach yeah. competitors and non competitors. It does vary it's massive, quite massively greatly. Different. Yeah. So I'm just so used to competitors now that a gen pop I'd, I'd really start to struggle you know but i love both like yeah, no, you do. yeah no, you do. i do love both and i do miss gen pop and i miss one-to-one -one pt if i'm honest like yeah. i miss turning up and, and seeing people and interacting and you know taking 50 60 pounds off someone you know however there are still some people that were out too out of shape when they started prepping i'll take like 50 pounds off them but yeah 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 that's not good but yeah, like, <laughs> but yeah, I, I definitely sort of prefer going down the competitive aspect of things, and I think that's where my business will solely head. And not to sort of like you know say if you're a Gen Pop client of, of Danny, she'll she will coach you for as absolutely as long as she wants. But I think that that's um, or as long as you want, sorry. So I think, but I think that's where her business is heading is is more competitive because I saw you know obviously her first hand coaching Amy at the competition, like saw how. She's very, like, lit up, just like I am at a show. Like, this past weekend, every show that I go to, I get I get blues after. It literally gives you butterflies when your yeah. clients are going on stage. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I absolutely love it, and I know AJ's exactly the yeah. same. Yeah, um, yeah I, I just love <laughs> it so much. Like, after the Scottish weekend, on the, on the Monday and the Tuesday, I was, like, actually feeling a bit, like, a bit down because I just missed it. Um, I'm like a foghorn in the audience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just missed it so much, and I I, I lo just love being at the shows, um, and and being you know supportive of my clients for every single step, and the daily check ins, everything is just I just love every aspect of it. Um, so yeah, I guess that's that's where we're currently different, but if, if anything, we're very similar. Um, I think that's pretty much it to be honest in terms of the the coaching question there. Yeah. Um, do we agree on everything? I, I think we I think we have our disagreements, but they're just discussions. Yeah. Um, we, we very I don't rarely think there's argue. There's anything we point blank are like, no, that's not right, because we have no. very open minds. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. we'll discuss things yeah. and share our opinions. Yeah. But I don't think there's anything where we're like, no, that's not right. Yeah. And if we do have sort of like a you know something that Danny thinks is something and I don't agree then we'll always have a reason to back it up and we'll discuss it and we'll probably end up just agreeing anyway. So <laughs> we don't, we don't really argue about anything. Um, 
I do count trace macros in a mini cup, so you do, don't you? Yeah. I literally track, track everything. everything. Um, sometimes, to be honest, like I've always been like this, and I've always been kind of if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it properly. Especially as someone who has had to dig quite hard in the past, I don't want to be one of those people who has to end up going really low calorie because of the fact that they're not tracking everything properly. Mm, mm. And I always have that in the back of my head. And I also like, yeah, I just I'm one of those people who I like precision, I like accuracy. If I'm gonna do like a mini cut, I'll do everything really accurately and pretty. Accurate anally if i'm honest yeah. Yeah. um when i'm in my off season i do have more flexibility aj will attest to that like we go out for meals and i don't always danny tries to keep up with me <laughs> yeah the same <laughs> i don't always like track everything to the gram and alley out and things like that but when i'm in like a fat loss phase such as a mini quarter or competition prep i i find it hard not to be super precise and like just a bit anal with everything uh-huh, if i'm uh-huh. honest so yeah, I think I'm a bit different in the sense that uh, I lose fat really easily, and, and I, I don't definitely I, not. I just so easily, and I I know when I'm in a deficit, I can just feel it. Um, not that I auto-regulate that by just going, oh, I'm in a deficit today. I must be doing well. I don't do <laughs> no that. tracking for AJ. No tracking, intuitive dieting. Intuitive dieting. But no, I have I have basically set foods. I eat very similar each day, and for the most part. Like, I hate to sound like a dick, but I know the calories in vegetables. I know what 200 grams of blueberries looks like. And so, I, don't get me wrong, like, I do. I can eyeball that. Yeah, of course However, you can. I'm you, just a bit anal. You're just anal, yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not so anal at the moment. Um, we're saying anal a lot here. Um, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not so anal with vegetables oh, at the moment. So I don't really track my vegetables, if I'm honest, if I'm, I'm not weighing them. But when I'm in a deficit for a contest prep, oh my god, like, I'm absolutely, like, on it, on it with everything. Like, I'll weigh everything to the gram. And but that's bo- just my mindset. And I, I yeah. like to, I, I think this is not something that, I don't, I don't think this is an issue for Danny at all. I think it's fine for you to be the same on a mini cut. But when I'm in a contest prep, I like to save that switch that I can flick. And I can just say, okay, cool, let's go. Let's do this for 40 weeks and track my broccoli and weigh everything to the gram. And I know that I have the mental capacity to be able to do that for 40, 40 weeks or whatever. Um, but when I'm in a mini cut and I know that I'm going to lose scale weight anyway because I know that I'm, 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 I'm doing enough, I'm expending enough calories and I'm eating low enough calories to lose, you know, an extra gram of blueberries, an extra 10 grams of ketchup, you know, I'm not going to cry over that at night, so I am. Um, I'm a bit more relaxed, and uh, and I think that's a that's a good thing now and again when you when you when you can be. Something also like with females, especially myself, my scale weight fluctuates a lot more at that time of the month, and it's harder to look at my data and be like, right, I'm definitely progressing with fat loss. Mm. So partly for that reason as well, I like to be really accurate with everything, and no that I'm doing all that I can, if that makes sense. Yeah, Whereas sure. AJ drops weight like flipping ton of bricks as soon as he enters a deficit. Ton of bricks. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> ton of brick. Okay, so we'll take one more question, and this is probably more specific to me at the moment, but it will be for you in the future. And it's actually kind of specific. You can turn it on its head and sort of say whether you'd be honest. So it's a good question. It's when coaching multiple clients... Would you be honest with where they're going to place and whether one is going to place ahead of the other? So I will always be honest with the at the, a uh, degree of capacity of my knowledge. So I will always say where I think or how well I think they are going to do. Like, for example, Connor and Josh this weekend, I absolutely I knew the lineup. I knew there were three guys that would be very, very good. And I told Connor and Josh, I said, "This is going to be a tough lineup, boys. Like you're you're going to str- you're going to you're going to struggle here to 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 come up the top because they are both very young juniors. Um, they're just falling into the junior bracket. Like for example, Connor's just gone into an off season and he's going to come back in 2022 as a junior. 
Like, yeah, he's got that what? long. Yeah, he's got that long. Oh, my God. So he's going to take the whole of this year, the rest of this year, the whole of 2020, the whole of 2021, and then come back in 2022. Connie, you're going to look sick in yeah. 2022. Like, kill these next two years. He's going to look ridiculous. Wow. Yeah, when he when he when he said that because I didn't actually know when he when he was twenty three when he said when he was twenty three I was like okay game over like you're gonna be very difficult to beat in twenty twenty two mate you know because he's already wow. very good you know he's already a decent junior so he's gonna just be ridiculous but yeah so I said to them like it's gonna be a very hard show and this year is gonna be emotionally psychologically very tough for me because I'm invested into a lot of these guys and girls but. Guys, more specifically, because the guys that I'm coaching will know, like, if they work out and they keep following each other's progress, then they know who's competing against who. And I've got some pretty damn good guys who are going to be back to back with each other in the same lineups. Um, so we're looking at ideally what I want is like just create lineups where I've got like my guys one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and just get a load of British qualifications and then chuck them all in the final and have them all battle it out. And at that point, I'm not saying who's winning. Uh, right now, I'm telling people who's, like, I'm, I'm saying, like, you've got the potential to, like, do really, really well. And I know they have because I know what the caliber's like. I know full well what a British champion junior looks like because I've seen it three years in a row. You know, I know what it, I know what the junior is meant to look like when they win worlds. Um, and I know some of my guys have got that potential. So I'll just be honest with them and I'll say whether they have it or not. Um, and that that's it really. And then Danny, you you you're very similar, aren't you? In terms of when you were coaching Amy, you were yeah. You were I'm honest very, that she could do well. I'm very honest, and neither of us will blow smoke up our, up our clients' asses. No. And like sugarcoat the truth or lie about or exaggerate what they have the capability to achieve. For example, like I've had clients who approach me months ago and said that they want us to go straight into a contest prep and i've told them to take this year off and compete in 2020 because they're just not ready yeah i will always be honest and if someone's not ready they're not ready um if any of my clients get to the stage where they need to push their shows back i will tell them that yeah. i will not just you have them compete too fast. For... oh my god no <laughs> <laughs> um but i think it's really important to remember that Abort. every Oh my god. A bought Ev show. AJ, I'm trying <laughs> to be serious here. I think it's important to remember that everybody has their own potential and you can't control who else shows up to your shows. And I know AJ obviously knows the UK DFBA really well. He knows gonna he knows who gonna, who is going to show up to each show pretty much. With the the federations that my clients are competing in, they're absolutely huge federations and I legitimately don't know who's gonna turn up. Mm. so i don't even know myself how they are going to place in the lineup however what i can tell them is if they are in their best shape possible and if they're not i will push their show back or um just be really honest with them and say let's do it like this show is a bit of a warm-up and then a later one and get in condition or something um but i'll always be really honest with them about their potential and what they have the ability to achieve um, and I'll praise them where it's due. For example, with Amy, she did obviously so well at Body Power and Hull, and I know she has the potential to do very well at the British finals. I've told her that. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll always be really honest, but I think it's really important to remember that you can only control yourself, so it's pointless comparing yourself to other people who are going to turn up. Just show up in your best shape and you'll achieve your full potential. And if you've done that, you should be very proud of yourself. Yes, it's a competitive sport, but especially if it's your first season competing and, you know, you've never been stage lean before, you don't know what to expect from a prep don't focus on what everyone else is doing show up in your best shape and you will achieve your full potential and you can work from there yeah absolutely very good answer and one that will stick by for all of our coaching career until we're getting people on like pro stages which will be in the not so distant future and that at that point what do we do do we just say yeah you're you're a pro. Yeah. You're just a pro now. And you're just like... You've, you've achieved it. I think th that's actually a good comment because if we were going to coach pros, we'd have to have a really good understanding of the pro league. Yeah. You know, like, for example, like right now, 
like you, you, you yourself, you haven't gone to many IFBB pro no. shows. Don't get so, me wrong, I stalk them all over course, Instagram and I watch every single live. However, it's very different, different very to different. seeing it in real life. That's it. Um, so hopefully, you know, one day I'll get on the pro stage myself and I'll experience that myself. Yeah, yeah. But we'll see. Yeah. For now. Yeah, and, and I think that's an important one for coaches to... So if you're listening to this and you're a coach and you're telling your clients you'll win or... You're going to. You're going to turn pro. Yeah, you're going to okay. turn pro. Okay, like, do you know what a pro looks like? Like, do you know the difference between turning pro in the UK versus the US? Yeah. Do you know what the US caliber is like? Do you know what the IFBB are looking for if you're coaching a bikini athlete? Do you know what the standards are in UK FBA versus PCA versus two bros? Um, it, it, like in natural bodybuilding, do you know what the standards are conditioning wise now? Like, there is a lot of factors to consider and you've got to be at shows to be able to see what's required and what's exactly. needed. Which, and me and AJ, like, we both get to as many shows as we physically can. Yeah. Like, every single show that we can, we will be there. And we also go to a diverse range of federations as well. Yeah, like, for that, I'll go that to watch the UK, the FBA. I've seen what the quality is like there and what the bikini girls are like there. Obviously, I've competed with PCA and Two Bros myself and I've been to watch those shows. AJ came to watch my Two Bros show. I did. We, we really do do everything we can to understand the the differences between the federations and the differences between categories to the best of our abilities so that we can get our clients where they need to be for what they're competing in and not just be like, you've got a lot of potential, you know, let's just diet you and see what happens sort of thing. You will turn pro. And I think, yeah, too many people blow smoke up their own clients' asses, and I don't think it's a good thing because um, if you say to somebody that they're going to like win the british finals for example if you say to someone you are going to win the british finals if they don't win they're not going to be a very happy buddy yeah, yeah. they're going to be really upset really yeah. upset and you've just like set someone up for success and literally like basically pied them in the face yeah you have and that's something you'll immediately lose that client so for example like with connor like i didn't tell him he was going to win a british championship i didn't tell him he was going to win a show so after the show and he checked in today and he said how he felt, he said he felt awesome because I just told him we're just going to do the best we can and we're going to tick our boxes and we're going to see where that lands lands us and, and that's what he did and he had a fantastic season. So, yeah, on that note, I think we'll leave it there. So that's an hour and ten minutes of us chatting away. I hope you enjoyed it, guys. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it as always. You know, shoot it up on your Instagram stories and give us a tag and we'll be back again in a couple of weeks time with another one and another update by that point danny will be shredded uh, <laughs> that's laughable guys that'll be really all right cool guys and i will speak to you next week all right lots of love and yeah chat to you in a bit bye say bye bye bye